grit for the day. Lived experience from influencers who overcome with CEO and founder, Thomas Lee Johnson. You know, the situation going on in my country, Ethiopia, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a crisis. So I had to spend more time uh, talking about Ethiopia. In fact, that was my priority. To try to see like, I, I, we can, I, I can't just believe uh, in this 21st century, uh, such kind of war is happening. Yes. I mean, and uh, the whole international community is watching and they're not doing anything to stop it. I just can't believe that. So I uh, had to, I had to talk. Hey, it's good to see you. Welcome to Grit for the Day podcast. I am CEO and founder of AgileImmersive.com, Thomas Lee Johnson. AgileImmersive.com is a transformation strategy firm where we help organizations transform into higher performing versions of themselves. In these times of shared turmoil and shared calamity, we must also share our collective wisdom and the psychological safety of belonging to the human family. Umoja ni nguvu. Unity is strength. In this episode, we will be having a conversation with the founder of Ubuntu Leadership Institute, Johannes Mezgebe. Johannes was an actual fellowship member of Archbishop Desmond Tutu's fellowship in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for his work to end apartheid. Here he is pictured with former President Nelson Mandela. Today's episode will be a conversation about the work that Johannes has been doing to end the conflict between the Tigray region and the rest of Ethiopia. There have been 500,000 dead as a result of the war in Tigray over the last two years. The war began in November of 2020 and it's still ongoing. There are also one million internally displaced people that have been moved from the Tigray and Northern Ethiopia into Sudan as a result of this war. Today's conversation will also include Johannes' mention of another one of his mentors, and Mr. Doug Coe. Mr. Doug Coe is seen here with the late Reverend Billy Graham and President H.W. Bush. Doug Coe is a founder of The Fellowship, also called The Family, which is a faith-based prayer group that influences world leaders to bring about peace and unity. Welcome to Grit for the Day. With me today is a friend of 13 years uh, who I spent time with and met uh, in Kenya, actually. It was in Kenya uh, right after uh, some troubles uh, between some warring factions uh, after the 2008 election in Kenya. Uh, Mr. Johannes Mesgebe, the Honorable Mr. Johannes Mesgebe, uh, I met him uh, doing some humanitarian work to help children that were internally displaced uh, inside of Kenya after ethnic uh, conflicts. What Johannes, what stood out about Johannes immediately after I met him is, do you see the smile on his face right now? <laughs> this man has a permanent smile <laughs> on his face and everywhere he goes, every person he touches, everything he attempts to do, he brings infectious passion, hope, inspiration, and charisma. In Ethiopia, our economy is collapsing. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Mm. Military is weakening, the society is socially polarized, and our image is really damaged globally. I mean, these are the consequences of 
lack of understanding what really went wrong. And that's why I needed to focus on discussing the fundamental reasons, the causes of the war. A lot of people talk about the attack of the North Command Force yeah. in Tigray as a root cause of the conflict, which in my book, I don't even mention it for once at all yeah. as a that has so, never been a Anyway, so, so that yeah, was so, a part of Okay, so thank you for that. If you, if you had to say these are the top three reasons th that were the top root causes for the war, those top three root causes are? Well, I'm to, when I talk of the root causes, I'm talking about the immediate root causes that caused the, the war. But we've, yeah. had, we've had attention. Uh, so one would be uh, dissolving of the political party that uh, they had. Yes. Uh, number one, uh, the tension between the uh, a group identify themselves as ethno-nationalist group. Mm. So they want to advance an identity-based politics. And the other group, you know, they are more of an integrationist. Right. So that tension has always been there, but it was really provoked. Mm. And I think the third uh, cause would be uh, the uh, unconstitutional constitutional amendments. Unconstitutional amendments, yeah. Election, and also the positively negative Ethiopian relations. I call it positively negative because it is a positive move to uh, make a peace with Eritrea. Okay. And develop a very good relationship. But you just want to use that peace process uh, for the betterment of, of our countries. But apparently, that's not the case. So, yeah, so those five, I can just tell you, played a huge role in provoking uh, the conflicts. Okay. But obviously, we could have managed them. I mean, you know, we could have prevented the war from happening uh, yeah. because. I would summarize them as it was a conflict between, uh, on one hand, uh, sense of entitlement and egos and pride and arrogance of a few powerful individuals. And on the other hand, uh, lack of uh, understanding in managing the change. Yeah. So I think we could have prevented the war uh, if we were, you know, able to prioritize the interests of the wider public than self. Right. But eventually, uh, this personal feeling of few individuals uh, became initialized into the political system and governmental issues. Now, that's why people talk a lot about ethnic issues and political ideology, or even the federal uh, configuration. Uh, it was not the case, but through yeah. time, these few people, they internalize their personal feeling into the system, and they gotcha. make it look like, gotcha. yeah. yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about, you know, why you went to jail, and how you got yourself out of jail. So, few a couple of months before the current prime minister Abiy Ahmed was appointed as the prime minister of Ethiopia. He had to be elected to be the chairperson of the ruling party. So the TPLF, which is the ruling party of uh, in Tigray, had a very powerful security and military wing. And uh, especially following the days of Prime Minister Mellas, these individuals who run the security uh, and military became very powerful and they captured the states. But they had issues between 
the former chief of staff of the army, General Samora, and uh, the former chief intelligence, Gita Trust of Fab. So that future between the two of them created a space for this new group, they used to call themselves Tim Lama, which the current prime minister was part of, to kind of maneuver, to use that tension between the two big guys uh, to, 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 to mobilize support from the rest of the, the uh, party leaders and the public and the diaspora to put pressure against them. That's how Prime Minister Abiy also came out uh, to the public. Anyway, so I happened to be, uh, you know, those days a very close friend to the current Prime Minister. Uh, and also there is another friend who we call it Lamma Megersa. Apparently, he has, he has worked at the same gym, right? Yes, we went to the same gym for more than 10 years. Like, we, not only that we went to the same gym, but, you know, we also had a time to have breakfast together for after the gym. So we had a wonderful time together. So I have a great respect for these brothers. I still do respect them. They are my brothers. They are my friends. I'm thankful to God that uh, God has brought these people into my life. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, so I come from Tigray. So the people that were fighting these two brothers actually come from the same tribe or state that I come from. Right. So for some reason, one of those uh, big guys came to me uh, to tell me how I should discourage these guys from uh, taking over power because apparently, you know, they, these people are the people who make king in the country. You know, they uh, run the military and security apparatus. So they make, you know, the king. So, but I think Abi came to power against that. You know, so they could not uh, endorse him. And uh, so he was a friend. I would meet him every day. So this guy came to me and said, uh, you know, he, told, he tells me stories against these guys. I mean, they're my buddies, my friends, and what the story this guy told me, regardless. I mean, he's from my tribe, my uh, state, but I didn't believe what he told me about these brothers because, you know, I, these are my brothers, I see them, I talk to them, so I know what they were doing. So whatever this guy told me about them was not really true. So I told him, no, that's not correct. So it was then that, the following night, uh, five guys came, told me that uh, they were sent by the command force. Uh, Ethiopia was under state of emergency. So they had a command, uh, no, they call it, uh, yeah, command force, whatever, command force, uh, who run, you know, the uh, state of emergency. So they said, like, so they needed to take me somewhere. They literally took me to a jail. Yeah. I didn't connect the dots that day. What? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, some of these guys, you don't say no. You know, they, nobody would say no. They're used to that. I mean, they're used to getting whatever they want. So they're not you really used to, you know, getting an answer. No. So I said to this guy, I thought I was helping him better understand the situation because by telling him what I knew about what these guys were doing, because these guys were not really against the public. Like, you know, he right. was telling me these guys are against the people of Tigray. Uh, these guys are this and that, which was not the case in those days. So I thought I was helping him better understand about them and about what they were trying to do because, you know, they, were, they, had, they meant well in those days. But anyway, that guy is a powerful guy. So yeah, so the following day, you know, five guys came from the chief intelligence office. Yep, the former chief intelligence. They showed me their ID. I asked for their ID. They showed me. So they took me, yeah, a couple uh, days in a jail. Did uh, they handcuff they you? No. And uh, so, so the, they just, you just assumed you had to do what they asked? 
but they did not physically force you to leave your home. No, they actually, well, they asked me to get into a car that they brought. And I said, who, who are you guys? And then they showed me their IDs. Uh, they had one policeman to carry, I mean, to bring with them because the four of them were just from the uh, intelligence service. So they don't really arrest people, I guess, according to them. So they had to bring a policeman with them to basically arrest me. And so what, what were the charges you were being arrested for? No, they didn't tell me. They asked me to go with them to a certain place. And they said I was demanded by the command post. So when they took me to the jail. Hold on, hold on. So they did not arrest you for a criminal charge. They asked you to get into the car because the commander wanted to see you. Is that correct? Well, they said a command post. I don't know what that means. It's it's a, a group of military officers that basically administrates the country during a state of emergency. Right. So so anyway, I followed their uh, instruction, got into the car, but they took me to a jail, and then that's when I realized these guys are arresting me. So you got into the car because why? Because they said so. That is basically what you do sometimes when you know when you have a state of emergency. So that declaration of state of emergency allows the security officers to arrest people without even arrest warrant. Okay. Did you know? So I just want I want to go to your mentality. The moment. Five people, four intelligence officers, and one police officer is in front of your home, your residence, right? It was, a, it was actually in a restaurant called Radisson Bulu. I, I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I had dinner. So as I was coming out, they waited for me outside. They could not <laughs> get inside. So, they were waiting for me the whole night, the whole time, to, 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 so to, they're, they're, to ask me to go into the car. So they're waiting. They're waiting to arrest you yeah. outside a restaurant and you go to leave the restaurant. They say, come with us. They don't give you any charges. They don't put handcuffs on you. But I understand there's five of them. And when five men tell you to do something, you may be, you may feel intimidated to do it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Did you know at that moment when you got in the car, you were going to jail? Yes. How? So the guys, one of the guys made a phone call as soon as I'm, I was in the car. So made a phone call to someone that I don't know, saying that, yes, we got him. It was like, he sounded like, he uh, captured like uh, someone, uh, a general, <laughs> like in a war field. <laughs> so yeah, I think from the conversation that he had with the, uh, later on, I knew that guy. He was uh, an intelligence officer, uh, director in the intelligence office. Yeah, so so then I realized, okay, these guys are taking me to jail. But I didn't know why. I didn't make that connection with the conversation I had with the previous day until later on. And the reason why you got taken to jail is because you said no to the intelligence chief. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's not just because I said no, because, you know, uh, first of all, I mean, they, they're not used to that. And I also believe uh, in the... Uh, in what I had to say, because... Uh, Hercules Enterprise is my invention. It came to evolve as I worked one-on-one -on -one with presidents and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. One such company, the leader of a financial services company headquartered in Wisconsin, came to me and said he had serious constraints uh, and, and, let's say, uh, broken relationships on his leadership team. 
through a uh, course of assessment uh, using Frictionless Enterprise, we identified the awareness, purpose, orientation, goal, and cadence of his leadership team. And through that assessment, we were able to diagnose, find the challenges, and actually give them a fix-it plan, which is being implemented at this very moment to great success. Frictionless Enterprise works. It's a transformation strategy that sticks and helps you become steadfast in transforming to ever greater and higher performing enterprise. Go to agileimmersive.com to learn more. Culture. And we are actually related to one another. And there's no way that, you know, we can find any solution by ignoring one another. Or by... Uh, I mean, you know, fighting them through war, what basically we are doing right now. So yeah, I believed in, uh, first of all, we didn't have issues that that we had to, to, to I mean, uh, to get us into the situation with them. I mean, at, at, to begin with. And second of all, whatever happened, so by gone is by gone. So we need to, to resolve our situation. So I think reconciliation is very, very important. So when I meet with these guys, every time I meet with them, so I talk to them the importance of fixing our problems by ourselves. But obviously, they would not agree with me. They would you know, tell me their stories. And I tell them because I don't belong to government officials. So I don't, you know, uh, I tell them that, you know, I am approaching them, meeting with them, talking to them as a brother, as, as an ordinary citizen. But I try to emphasize the importance of uh, the brotherhood, the fraternity. And you know, that is the only way that we can help uh, maintain a sustainable peace in our region, as well as uh, uh, achieve our vision, which is a prosperous uh, uh, Eritrea and a prosperous Ethiopia. Yeah. So that relationship is very important. So that's the reason why I am always engaging with these people. Yeah. But for the security intelligence, so I think it was not that, that case. I mean, you know, they they were dying. I mean, in some, I mean, at some point to 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 fix the situation with Eritrea, but they didn't know how. So when Abi, you know, made that uh, step to actually go over there and then make the peace, I mean, you've seen how everybody was so happy about the. Uh, uh, the situation between Ethiopia and Eritrea. So everybody wanted to do that. But I think the main reason was they didn't like my relationship with the two people that they were pursuing to arrest. Yes. The current minister of Ethiopia, Abi, and uh, Abi's former boss, uh, right. Gerson, who was head of the partisan. So these are like my brothers. So they didn't want them to take over power but they saw me as someone from their own state, from their own tribe, advocating for a change and through supporting these two guys. So this right. is the reason why they had to arrest me. And you asked me like how I got out of the prison was because another general, a very good friend of mine who heard about this chief intelligence arresting me, so he came to the prison. It wasn't easy, but he had to fight the intelligence uh, officers and got me out of the prison. So because you were he knew, you... he knew my relationship with these guys. He knew. Thank you for joining us on Grit for the Day I mean, podcast. I, I'm your host, Thomas Lee, TJ like, Johnson. Like, yeah. Like, it has so been the general, a delight so to spend general, time with you today. The general, what's it? Can you say the general's name? Yeah, his name is General Tekele Brahan, the other guy. He was actually head of, director of IMSA, which is called, which is an abbreviation for uh, INSA, Institute of National uh, Security Agency. It's like equivalent to the NSA here in the U.S. Right. So the, the director of the NSA had to break you out of jail. What was going through your mind the days that you were in jail, how did you endure being in jail? Listen, that's a very good question. First of all, 
you cannot, I mean, you can never tell what could happen to you. I mean, you're now under the hand of this powerful guy. He can destroy you. And nobody would, you know, question him. And that has happened a lot. So I had a lot of mixed feelings. There is part of me would say, I mean, I was really uh, going back and thinking about what has, what have I done like over the last few days, few weeks. That's how I actually figured out uh, what, why uh, I could be in jail because of that issue. And I, I, I took time to think, what have I done? Then I say to myself, okay, I'm not going to regret what I have done. So there's part of me that says, I was so happy that I did what I did. I stood by my orders and I was ready for whatever to happen to me. So that is that part of me. And of course, there is also part of me that tried to reach out to the people in government, like you know, the general. Because I knew such people are very fair, understanding, and would bring a solution. So I was, I was going through those mixed feelings of, you know, part of me, like I said, trying to find a solution by meeting uh, someone who can bring justice to this issue. And there's part of me saying, yeah, whatever these guys do to me, I mean, they can do that, but deep inside, I was, I was uh, happy, I was not really regretting. Yeah. Right. So from today's conversation with uh, Johannes Mesgebe, his grit story meant that he had to endure. He had to endure political persecution. He had to endure jail. He acknowledged that he was sad. He was scared. Being the prisoner of the intelligence chief of Ethiopia is no small thing. He said that people get disappeared and never heard from again. But he said he was ready to die for what he believed. And that is there should be a peaceful solution to the Tigray-Ethiopian conflict. And he would not betray his friends who were in government. He also said that he lives with no regrets. And that is a powerful lesson on grit. But what's even more phenomenal about Johannes is that to this very day, he still meets with Eritrean leaders and advocates here in the United States. And with the possibility of persecution, if he ever returns to Ethiopia, he still advocates for forgiveness and for reconciliation. And that is Johannes Mesgebe's story and his message for us and his encouragement for grit for the day. Grit for the day. Lived experience from influencers who overcome. With CEO and founder, Thomas Lee Johnson.